today, really what this is, is kind of a glorified tour through Google Forms. It is not really a session on building formative assessments. I'm assuming you guys know what formative assessments are. So all I'm going to do is show you a quick tour through Google Forms. Uh, we're going to look at settings and the different types of questions that can be used, and then a way to analyze the data within the form itself. If you guys are familiar with Google Forms already, you probably know most of this stuff and wouldn't really need to be here uh, unless you want a refresher or unless you have nothing better to do and you just want to listen to me talk. I don't know. I, you know. Um, so, you know, having said that, I know, especially at like middle and high school level, you know, down at elementary level, they have a lot of assessments that they can use for all their foundational skills and keeping track of all of that stuff. And they don't necessarily need Google Forms. Here, I'm thinking the best use of this would be for things like entrance tickets, exit tickets, not necessarily the kind of stuff that would end up in jump rope. Um, although you could use a longer Google form to make a more comprehensive formative assessment if you wanted to and put the grade in jump rope. Um, you know, that's certainly one way to use it. Uh, plus it ends up putting all the answers in a spreadsheet for you that you can go back and look at later. And it holds on to all of those results in one place for all of your students. Um, those are the advantages of it. Excuse me. It's early and I haven't had enough tea yet. So forgive me if I get a little scattered. Um, we have a 90 minute block. I am not going to talk to you about Google Forms for 90 minutes. That's just not going to happen. Um, we might get 20 minutes and maybe 25, depending on what questions you guys have. And then you will have time to go off and play with the forms. I'll be here for questions that you might have later. I'll let you build some formative assessments, do whatever you guys need to do. Maybe you've got some units that you need to put some assessments together for and you'll have time you, you can do that um, right so having said that let me see if i can share my screen i'm gonna just share I'll share the entire screen because okay bear with me here I'm going to assume you guys can see what I'm looking at I see nodding heads that's good so not to tell you guys stuff you don't already know, but to get into Google Forms, you would go to your Google Drive. You go up here and click where it says New. Go down the menu till you find Google Forms and click on Google Forms. So I know that this is stuff you guys know already. But that brings up essentially an untitled Google form. So the first thing I'm going to do is give it a name. That's form one. Okay. You can give it a description. If you have some specific learning target or whatever you want your students to be focusing on, uh, you could put that in the description. Uh, you don't have to. One of the first things that I would do is right here where it says change settings. I would click right on that and look at the settings. Um, under this option to make it a quiz, you can assign each question point values. You can set answers where it says that there's an answer key available. 
and you can provide feedback for certain types of questions. Um, in, in a proficiency-based grading system, I don't know how well that really works anymore, uh, the way Google has set it up. There are some questions that don't allow you to set an answer key, uh, even though you might think it should let you. And that kind of interferes with uh, the purpose of that. Uh, however, there are certain other settings, like here under responses, when I open up that tab, the thing that I want to make sure I've done is collect email addresses and turn that on. Uh, if you don't do that, you won't know who's answered, who's given which answer uh, to the question. Uh, you can send responders a copy of their response. So if you turn that on, when they submit the form, it'll send them a copy of uh, their answers back. You can allow students to edit their responses once they've submitted them, if that's something you want to do. If I'm doing a quick entrance or exit ticket, I don't necessarily think I would do that um, because they're probably not going to go back in and edit anyway. At that point, it's, you know, those are meant to be a couple, two, three minute, one or two question sort of thing. Um, in most of our forms, this one here where it says require sign in, we're restricting users to the greater Rutland County Supervisory Union accounts. So most students will have to sign in. They're using Chromebooks, so they're signed in to their accounts anyway. We really don't need to worry about that, but I leave that turned on. Um, this next item right here, limit to one response. Uh, you can turn that on and then students can only enter one response uh, to the exit ticket. And I personally think I would turn that on unless you want someone submitting two or three responses at once to your, to your formative assessment. If you're giving a longer formative assessment and you want students to be able to go back and change answers, this allow response editing could be turned on and then they could edit their responses later if that's something that you want them be, to be able to do. Um, under presentation, uh, there are different things that you can do in a, in a formative assessment or in a, any Google form for that matter, in a survey, you can show a progress bar, which tells them how far along they are, depending on the number of questions you've got. If there's only two or three, you really don't need it. Uh, if you're worried about students looking at each other's answers, you can shuffle the question order. Uh, that's an option that's available. Um, after, after the form has been submitted, uh, it gives a confirmation message automatically. The typical message is your response has been recorded. You can edit and change that to about anything you want it to say. Um, you can allow students to see the results summary of the assessment. Uh, I typically leave that turned off because I don't find there's a need for that most of the time. But if you're giving, if you're giving a more formal assessment through forms and you do want to share uh, the overall results, you can. I don't think I would do it just because, um, you know, they don't need to see each other's names and responses and all of that. This restriction down here, I would probably never turn on. Uh, it's disable autosave. And what that does, if you turn it on and a, a person goes in to answer the questions in your form and it gets interrupted, like the internet drops out or their Chromebook shuts off or something strange happens, it doesn't save any of their responses to any of the questions and makes them start all over again. If you leave it turned off, it will save the responses to the questions they've already answered and they can pick up in the form where they left off.
there are certain default settings. Uh, the reason that the collect email address was, was turned on automatically for my form is because I have it set as a default setting for me to just automatically collect email addresses. Uh, if I'm doing some kind of anonymous feedback, I'd want to turn that off, that function off. But um, most of the time you want their email addresses. And then one other default setting that I find useful is this make questions required by default. You can, there is an option on each question to turn off the require an answer, which means they could skip an answer and not answer, not give anything and submit the form without answering a question. If you make the question required, it won't allow them to submit the form without answering the question. So going through, having gone through the settings, are there any questions from anybody about any of this? Uh, Catherine, yeah. Um, working with younger kids, I'm not sure. I'm thinking, you know, I work up with sixth grade. So with some of the older kids, this would be doable. But I'm in, even in third and fourth grade with some struggling readers, can you use the Read and Write app with this? I believe you can. Yes, um, it, it you know it is a it, it's a piece of Google. Uh, Google Read Write should work with everything, and it does open in your web browser. And I believe Read Write reads anything that's opened in a web browser tab. Okay, thank you. Uh, let's see. I think you can also use some other plugins, things like. Um, Equasio and, and some of those kind of things will work in Google Forms as well if you're trying to put math questions in into the form. So that's a good point, actually. Thanks for asking that. Um, OK, so the next the next thing to look at really are the types of questions that you have available to you. And I had been playing with this a little bit. Um, the most basic type of question and what it usually defaults to for me is this multiple choice. Uh, we're all familiar with that. Uh, I'm just going to put something in there and add a couple of options. And that's pretty self-explanatory. Uh, to add another question, you just come over here to the plus, click Add Question. Um, you can take a short answer type of question. You know, you would have, that would be a basic check for knowledge, usually, is what I would do with short answers. Um, you have the ability to take paragraphs. So if you were assigning an English assignment to somebody and you were looking for their thesis statement, you could ask them for it. It would collect it, put it in a spreadsheet, and you could review your entire classes. Um, you know, opening uh, thesis statements for a paper or any other kind of an idea that uh, where you might be looking for more connections or uh, something more in depth in terms of are they getting it? Are they making the connections between ideas? That sort of thing. Sorry, excuse me. Um, Just going to call that long answer. I could spell. It would be great. Um, what else did I look at? There was a way that I found that you could do a fill in the blank type of question. So. And here you would you would put your blank for 
the term. That's a bad example, but So I've got a question with four blanks in it. And then over here under the options, there's this multiple choice grid. And that's what I would select to do a fill in the blank where under columns, I would give that A, B, C, and D. And then under rows, yeah, you would fill in the words, oops, again, spelling, blank, options, word bank, answers. Now, I, I've made it pretty obvious and gone A, B, C, and D for the blanks in my sentence, but you get the idea. You could uh, you could have students fill that out. And then we'll, in a bit, we'll take a look at it and see how that actually works when you uh, submit the form. Um, and of course, you all, you're all familiar with forms enough to know there's the linear scale. Uh, you can also if you have more than one answer, you can use check boxes instead of the multiple choice, pick one. Uh, there's drop down menus if spelling is important and you're, you need to sort your answers a specific way when you go into the analysis. Um, the check box grid works very similarly to the multiple choice grid. I was struggling though, finding an actual use for the check box grid. Um, earlier. I had used it once a long time ago in forms when I was putting together an order form for flowers that we were selling out of a tech center, but uh, I couldn't figure out how to apply it to, to this context. Uh, the linear scale You know, scale one to five. Oops. And that was, you know, that's the basics of the form. I know a lot of you guys have seen this already. Maybe you've used it, maybe you haven't. But um, do you have any questions about that part of Google Forms. Uh, okay, hearing none. The next thing that I would do with this, you guys are all pretty much using Google Classroom, I, I assume. Uh, maybe you are, maybe you're not. What you want to do is click on send the form and then I would come over here. You can send it via email if you have an email list built. Uh, with students, it's more likely that we're going to copy the link. I would shorten the URL up so that it's not some big long thing. And then I would copy the link. 
and I would put it right into my Google Classroom as an assignment. For you guys, I'm going to ask a favor of you. I'm going to paste the link into the chat. And for this next part, uh, just, and I know they're not real questions, but just go in and click on the questions. Give me some answers, uh, if you wouldn't mind, so that I can show you how the response side of this works. Hopefully you all have access to the form. I think I said it right. Okay, I've got, well, I've got five responses from you. I see there's seven of you in the meet, but uh, we'll go ahead with what we've got. So up here, you just click on your responses tab. It tells you how many responses you've received. We've just gone up to six. Um, and there are some options here. The first thing I'm going to look at is this quick summary of responses. So I can see here are the names of people that have responded. So I know which of my students have responded. Under this first question, it gives you just a simple pie chart for the multiple choice response. I can, interestingly, 50% of you picked option three. Uh, if there were right and wrong answers there, it would tell you the percentage of your students that actually got that content, the percentage that had other understandings of it, and, and you could work with those students to find out why they answered the way they did. Um, it's also a quick check if you're using this as an exit ticket, you know, how much did 50% of my class got it. Well, what do I need to reteach and why? Um, How do you know which student had which response? Well, up here, you can go to individual responses. Uh, and I can see that this particular form was Alex Fox's form, right? She picked option one, short answer, yes, this is helpful, long answer, happy Friday. Here's my fill in the blanks. And here's my, um, you know, very familiar with the solar system. That's awesome. So this is Alex Fox. I have a drop down menu where I can pick any of the students in my class or I could just go to the next student. So now I've got Stacy. I can see her answers. Now I've got Marcy, I can see her answers. Um, so that is this individual tab over here on the right. I can also look at each question individually to see what responses I got. So option three, I got three responses. I can click on that and see the names of the people who gave me that response. 
Okay. So the people who answered option two, I can click on two responses and see the names of the people who picked option two. I can go on to my next question for short answer. I got one response of bonjour. I can see who did that. And it gives me each of the different responses. So someone said, hi, Al, that was David. Uh, that's so there's a couple of different ways to figure out who answered what on which question. Uh, one would be looking at individual students and one would be looking at each question and then selecting uh, the response to see who gave that response. Uh, hopefully that helps you guys a little bit. This fill in the blank gives you a bar chart to show you who answered. You know, which answers I got for each of the uh, words in the word bank. And then you've got your bar chart showing you how familiar your class is with whatever material you're looking at. You know, this would make a great entrance ticket kind of a thing. I might get a little more specific than what I did, but, you, you know, formulating the questions that's dependent on the content. Um, does that answer the questions on the res how to view the responses? Catherine, do you have something? I'm sorry if I missed this, but how do you, where do you find this? How do you get to this responses page? So from your test form, so here's the original form that I set up and sent the links to you guys from. Right up at the top, there are options for you. So if you're looking at the questions part, I can look at and edit the questions in my form. The next option is responses. So under responses, it shows me six people responded to my uh, quiz. And if I click on that, it goes right to the data okay, and gives you. you the quick summary. Uh, it defaults to the summary tab. But again, if you want to look at how people responded to each question, you just select the questions tab. Uh, if you want to know how an individual student answered, you can select the individual uh, response tab. Uh, what it doesn't do, and this is the last thing I'm going to show you guys, unless there, does anybody else have a question about this piece? Okay. Um, what it doesn't do for you is automatically create the spreadsheet. In order to create a spreadsheet out of this, you can see this little green box over here. Uh, that's the symbol for Google Sheets. And if you click on it, um, it'll create a new spreadsheet based on this test form. Or if you already have an existing spreadsheet, it'll open the existing spreadsheet. Uh, since this is a new form I created, I don't have one. I'm going to create a new spreadsheet. And then I come over here and click on Create. And it opens this up in a spreadsheet for me. Now, what would be the use of this uh, if you've already got a nice summary of responses? Uh, it, for me, it would be useful to have the spreadsheet available so that if I had more than one class, I could put all my answers in one place. Um, if I wanted to refer to it later, it's a good way to store all of this information. If I wanted to do some advanced sorting within Google Sheets, uh, you know, I can't do that under the summary of responses tab in, in uh, Google Forms, but I could uh, 
I didn't intend this to be a lesson in Google Sheets necessarily, but I could uh, turn on the filters for my header row, which is each of my, uh, each question in my form becomes the header of each column in the spreadsheet. Uh, so I could conceivably go in and filter out the different options. Like if I wanted to know everybody that picked option three, I could select that and say, okay. And then I have those students who gave me option three. I could use this to create student groups. Uh, you know, if I had a group of students that I knew got the material and I wanted them to work with other students who weren't getting the material. I could use this to pick out those students who were going to lead a discussion group. Um, if I had a group of students that was just really struggling with some material and I sorted that group out, I could pick them to work with me during the class as part of a small group while I gave an assignment to another group of students. Uh, for them to work on on their own. Yes, Alex. Um, back on the response sheet, if you assigned points to them, where would it show like their grade out of the total points? That's a good question. I don't actually know the answer. I didn't play with that. Um, and I apologize, I should have that answer. Um, okay. I just know I've assigned maybe my e my email address i must have not clicked on because i had all these responses and i didn't know whose response was who and so it showed me like six out of seven or something like that but i wasn't able to tell which student actually <laughs> gave the response because i didn't click click, click on that so yeah um that and that is you have to have them collect the email addresses um, that's where that problem came in. But yeah. And that's why in those settings where I showed you, I have the default set up to automatically collect email addresses. Um, because usually I want to know who's answered the question how. If I'm... I've got to be careful of that in my settings, though, because if I give a... If I'm creating a form, like say I'm collecting feedback for how this in-service day went uh, from instructors. And I want honest answers. And it might be something where people might not tell me if they know they're connected to the answers. Uh, that usually a climate survey form or some kind of a form like that, I absolutely have to not collect email addresses because it tells you that your email address is being collected. Uh, and I just know that in some instances, people won't give honest feedback if they know that's happening. Um, not that any of you guys necessarily feel that uncomfortable here. I don't know. Um, and I'm not, you know, this is all kind of an aside at this point, a little bit of a rabbit trail, but I've, I've worked in places where the environment wasn't so good. And in order to get honest feedback, you had to not, you had to make it anonymous. Um, but I do have that default set to automatically collect emails so that I know who's given which response. And, and you absolutely need that in, a, in an assessment. Uh, on the other hand, when I give you time to work, you know, you could play with that option, assign some point values to your questions, and then respond to it yourself a couple of times and see how it you know, how it presents that in the responses. Uh, that would tell you how the point values were assigned. Part of the reason I didn't play with that is because there were some questions that when I tried to set it up as a quiz, uh, I couldn't put an answer key into certain questions that I would have wanted to put an answer key into, you know, so that I knew I was getting, 
there's got to be a right answer if you're going to have a point value. If there's not a right answer and it becomes subjective, uh, you know, especially in the ELA world, things are very subjective. Um, it, it gets to be much more difficult if you're looking for specific answers to specific questions and you can't input an answer key. Uh, and I'm kind of dragging that out and I apologize, but um, there was a reason I didn't play with the point value anyway. Um, I guess having gone through all of that before I turn you guys loose to explore this on your own, I, you know, I don't know if you have your own formative assessments you want to build or other questions you want to have answered. Um, are there any questions about the form? Uh, if not, I'm going to give you guys time to uh, play with forms on your own, explore it. Uh, I'll be here for questions uh, throughout the um, session if you have any. Otherwise, this is your time to uh, you know, do some planning, build your own forms, create something for your classroom. Thank you, Al. This was really helpful. <laughs> Thank I you. I hope so. Um, again, I'll be here for the rest of the hour if you guys have any questions. So.